I think there's probably very few people in the room who are actually still involved in what we would broadly call mainframe culture um, uh, to say uh, that whatever it is that you're doing is probably not happening in a big building or a big factory or et cetera, that whatever, that all the things that used to be necessitate enormous machinery, whether that was political or physical or whatever kinds of machinery, is sort of leaking out into these smaller bits. And that's where all of the interesting things are happening. It's also where the business is. Uh, Fred Wilson said it the other day uh, in a very good way. I thought scarcity is a shitty business model, uh, that if you are depending on scarcity, uh, in one way or another in your business, uh, that's a relatively dead end. Um, that most things from the future are made out of stuff that's kind of leaking out from anything that was authentically or artificially scarce. And every once in a while, like every once in a while, something from the future actually lands in Brooklyn. Um, and it's difficult to recognize. Uh, it's in this building on the left uh, uh, next to a huge storage facility. Uh, that's what it looks like on the inside. Um, and if you go in there, uh, and weave your way around, uh, you will find uh, Oliver and Ellen at uh, Genspace. Um, and the, what the bottom line with what they're doing is to say that bio is no longer mainframe either. That everything that you think about in terms of bio is requiring huge labs and all of that is uh, basically coming onto streets like in Brooklyn and you can call it garage bio and you can call it biohackers, you can call it biopunk or whatever. It actually looks like this. I brought art students there and we tested for the CCR5 mutation under Oliver's watch, which was amazing. And it's the bottom line is, is just that the future belongs to those who understand DNA as actual material, like to really work with in real terms. And that it belongs to the people who understand that DNA has these things in common with information and ideas, which is that important things spread um, and that's what nature does, and that's what these guys do, and it's amazing. And so, please welcome them, Oliver. And Thank you very much for that introduction, Kevin. So I'm a molecular biologist by training. Um, as Kevin mentioned, Ellen and I opened up a community biotechnology laboratory in Brooklyn. Uh, so we're going to introduce you to a social revolution that's been happening in biology. It's been known by a number of names. One of them is DIY bio, or do-it-yourself biotechnology. And what that means is essentially, um, we have groups of individuals, people with PhDs in biology, hackers, enthusiasts, hobbyists, coming together and working with biotechnology, working with the tools of biotechnology to try to come up with solutions, try to learn from one another, and try to create. So before we go into the DIY bio movement, and the community bio lab we established in Brooklyn. I want to first reintroduce everybody to biotechnology. And I say the words reintroduce because biotechnology is perhaps one of the oldest technologies of humanity. So it's usually thought of, thought of as something being very new and sometimes a little scary. But if we look back in history, thousands of years ago, all the foods that we eat right now, the grains, the animals, all of that was generated by humankind. None of this exists in the wild. The corn, the tomatoes, everything that we eat, those are not wild type varieties. Those, those are genes that have been manipulated, teased by humanity over the centuries. And if we fast forward a little bit to the last hundred years ago or so, most of the technologies that we've used in our society have been derived from biological sources. So this is just an example of one type of biological material. It's a plastic. So this is a bioplastic. It's a, it's a casein-derived plastic that's been cross-linked and polymerized. And casein is a protein you find in milk. So it's a milk protein. So you can make a lot of hard, durable items out of milk proteins. Other types of uh, biologically derived materials were organic solvents, such as acidone and butyl alcohol. These were generated in fermenters from strains of bacteria that were isolated in the wild and grown up. We even had engines at one point that utilized plant-derived matter as a fuel source, peanut oil in this case. That's actually an engine created by Rudolf Diesel, the diesel engine. And we even at one point had a large percentage of vehicles that ran on electricity, swappable batteries. But humankind being humankind, we always try to look for easier solutions. We try to find things that are less labor-intensive, cost less money. 
And we looked around, and at one point, we looked down on the ground, and we saw something burbling out. And it had some amazing properties. It had a lot of energy locked up in it. It contained something known as complex hydrocarbons. You could use it as a fuel source. You could run a lot of things on it. And you could also create a lot of materials from it, all sorts of materials. It was pretty amazing stuff. In fact, when we looked at this material, it seemed inexhaustible at the moment. So it was cheap, it was plentiful. What can go wrong? Stuff was so amazing that it was used to create machines that made other machines that then powered other machines that carry this stuff around to other places. So, of course, I'm talking about oil. Now, a large percentage of the oil is used to generate fuels. But a significant amount of it is used also to create most of the materials that we have in society. Almost everything that we use is based on oil, not just fuels. So what are some of the products? Well, it's practically everything. It's hard to point out what isn't made out of oil, either indirectly or directly. Clothes we wear, nylon, synthetics, polyesters, all sorts of polymers that keep us warm in winter, that keep us protected in blasts. All of our electronic devices, the casings, the components. Medical devices, such as heart valves, which use complex polymers. And even the pharmaceuticals we ingest, all the compounds that were primarily derived from plant products are now derivatives from oils. So pretty much everything we put in our bodies, we wear on our bodies, put in our fuel tanks, walk on, is all derived from oil. So where would we be without it? So obviously, we began to realize that there are some problems with this stuff. Right? So there's, evolution, there's ecological problems. This stuff is basically locked in the surface. It's a carbon source. And now it's being jettisoned into the atmosphere. And we have elevated CO2 levels. Even if we can take care of those problems, there's another problem. It's running out, right? It's a limited resource. It's a finite resource. It's not going to go on forever. So it does all of these things. So is there anything out there that can take its place? What are we going to do without it? Is there any think that's better? Is there any solution to this? Well, if we look around for a while, we'll notice that there is uh, another source of complex biological um, materials, not just the hydrocarbons in the ground, but that's life itself. So the cyanobacteria that lives in oceans generates all, most of the oxygen that you're breathing right now. These microbes, and my, many other microbes like them, can be manipulated using a technology known as synthetic biology. And synthetic biology has been developed over the past few, several years. It basically ties into computational biology. And since the beginning of the century, we've learned a lot more about biology and how to manipulate genomes. So some of the products that are coming out of synthetic biology are biofuels. We have the capability now to try to evolve organisms, try to introduce genes in which organisms can now create biodiesel fuels. And these biodiesel fuels are sustainable. So it's not something you're pulling out of the ground and now dumping into the atmosphere and having too much CO2, but it's synced directly into the carbon cycle, so it's clean and it's plentiful and it's reusable. What about our drugs? Well, biological materials, organisms can create every type of chemical that you can think of. So one example of one type of drug is a drug against malaria. The most important drug out there is a drug known as artemisinin. It's a small molecule. It's produced by a plant called Artemisia annua. And the problem is, is that the demand far outstrips the source. There's only so much of it you can grow in a given amount of space. So a lab in Berkeley, the Kiesling lab, what they've done is they've basically taken the synthetic pathway from this plant and introduced it to an organism we've been working with all our lives, Saccharomyces cerevisiae yeast. So instead of generating ethanol and CO2, we're now capable of producing artemisinin in a compact space, in a bioreactor. 
Another aspect of synthetic biology is making cheap biosensors that can be used to detect threats, environmental threats. And those hands that you see there are from an individual who basically is suffering from arsenic poisoning. Arsenic is an element that's naturally occurring that seeps into aquifers around the world. And it's a major problem in areas like Bangladesh, where over half the wells are contaminated with arsenic. And currently, there's no cheap and reliable way to detect the arsenic levels. So labs out there are building biosensors out of microbes that can detect arsenic down to levels of 10 parts per billion, which is essentially the cutoff point for the World Health Organization's safe limits of arsenic. OK, so I've been talking basically about developments that have been coming out of industry, developments that have been coming out of academia. Where does that leave the do-it-yourselfers? Where does that leave the community biolabs? Have do-it-yourselfers brought anything to the table of civilization, technology-wise? Well, there's a few good examples, just, just a few. Uh, there's a lot more. Uh, one is that do-it-yourselfers has basically established the entire aerospace industry. So those are Wright brothers, right? They're basically bicycle mechanics who are self-taught uh, mechanical engineers. There is a do-it-yourselfer named Merrifield who had a PhD in this technology, actually, but he couldn't, couldn't find a lab to do his work, so he built a basement lab with his fellow, and they developed basically established solid-phase chemistry synthesis of peptides, which revolutionized the industry, and it was a big enough deal that he was later awarded a Nobel Prize for it. And of course, it was these two guys. There's plenty of examples of do-it-yourselfers really driving technological evolution and revolution in society. And just as if, just like computer technology has been progressing through advances in semiconductor technology. So if you've heard of Moore's Law, where you have this progression of semiconductors, basically a doubling of the semiconductor density every two years or so, and it's accelerating. And this is really progressed technology to the point where each of us is now carrying, essentially, a cloud supercomputer in our pockets. And it's really pushed the development of technology down to everyone on the Earth, so anybody can now participate uh, in the fruits of this technology. And something similar has been happening in biotechnology. So one thing you've all heard about is the, personal, is the Human Genome Sequencing Project. That wrapped up in about year 2000. That's when the first draft was done. It took about 10 years, cost about $3 billion. It took scientists around the world and took equipment that fit into warehouses. So year 2000. This is a semiconductor that's in a current um, sequencing machine that just came out and hit the market this year. It does the same thing for about $1,000 and takes 24 hours. So think about that. If you wanted to sequence the human genome in 2000, it would take you $3 billion. You could do it now for $1,000. That's a pretty fast drop. And this is the machine itself. It's about the size of a printer, not a warehouse. So there have been other developments in, the, in technologies and biotechnology that have enabled more and more people to practice it. One of them that I've used is eBay. So if you go online right now, you can actually buy secondhand used equipment. This is a PCR machine, polymerase chain reaction machine that's used to amplify DNA. I actually looked this up last night, so it may still be up there for $149.95. I was thinking about purchasing it because that's a great deal. Supposedly it works, it's excellent condition. So if anybody wants to get it, I suggest you go online right now. It might be already sold out. And if you don't want to use the machines, there's plenty of companies right now that are outsourcing this technology. Here's one IDT. You can essentially design your genes in silico, send the sequences over, and for less than a few hundred euros, you'll get back your gene that you've designed. So all of these technologies essentially been enabling more and more people to practice uh, this science. And one group of very interested individuals are basically students. So this is an aerial view of a competition called the iGEM competition, International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition, that's been going on since 2004. And it's expanded to the point now where there are about 120 universities participating from almost every continent on the planet. And these are undergraduates, and in some cases, high school students that are actually doing and contributing to synthetic biology.
because of all of these advances that have basically lowered the threshold uh, for people to participate. So this is something that Ellen's gonna talk to you a little bit more about. The reason why we've established GenSpace, which is a community biotechnology lab, because science and technology requires a space for you to safely do the work and collaborate with people. And there's not a lot of places for you to do this. So if you think about it and all the problems that we have, there's about seven billion people on Earth. If just 1% of these people had access to a community laboratory, and in just 1% of that 1% were able to come up with a brilliant solution to some pressing problem. That's a lot of untapped potential. Okay, so Oliver gave you sort of the big picture view. I'm here to give you uh, this whole thing in a microcosm. Uh, first of all, I'm gonna tell you sort of what, it, what is this DIY bio and why should, you should care about it. Then I wanna demonstrate the evolution of it towards these community labs by using our lab, GenSpace, as uh, an example. So this is a picture of our founders. Uh, it's a group of seven people that came together. Um, there are other citizen science type pursuits, bird watching, amateur astronomy. When you start holding plates of living material, that's when people start getting nervous. So we met on this Google group. This was established by a couple of people who had gone through the iGEM competition process and who thought, hey, it would be great to continue working on some of the projects we started at iGEM. And so they founded DIY Bio. They coined the term. It was originally a Google group. It has now over 2,000 members all over the world. Although it's not really clear how many of those members are actively doing wet work, there are conversations going on daily about various aspects of biology. Unfortunately, in the beginning, I think a lot of them were more enamored with sort of the outlaw biotech imagery. This was picked up by the press, and when we came together in 2009 to form our group in New York, what happened was, I think this was sort of the impression that most people would have had of us had you asked them. This is actually what we were doing. This is some footage taken in uh, one of our members' kitchens. We're doing an electrophoresis experiment. We're also drinking beer. Uh, we limited what we did to simple things that didn't involve living organisms. This was just working with DNA, which in and of itself is not particularly dangerous. And we were okay with that. We would meet maybe once a week. But then we started thinking that we wanted a little more. Plus, the atmosphere with the press and everything. Two weeks after we met for the first time, we got our first call from the press, and it hasn't stopped since. So we decided that we really needed to kind of get our act together and become a little bit more formalized. And you'll see that the process of this, we were sort of dragged kicking and screaming into a structure. We didn't really want a structure. We were sort of a hobby group when we started. But because of the press and because just by chance we were the first group to really get ourselves off the ground, we really have encountered a lot of the challenges that these groups encounter before uh, the other groups have. Uh, this is one of our early meetings. There was actually a New York Times reporter present, and uh, the red hours are all the different safety things that we went through. So the next place we housed it was better than somebody's home. It was in a hacker space called New York City Resistor. And I think you'll find that a lot of these DIY bio groups start out of these hacker spaces. But even then, we didn't feel, even though they were brewing beer, and technically that's biotech, we weren't doing the same sorts of experiments. And we began to realize that if we pooled our resources and we had an actual space in a, in a commercial building, that the potential of what we could do was ever so much cooler. So we started to formalize ourselves more and more. So we decided to incorporate as a nonprofit. We wrote a, sort of a dual prong mission statement. The first was sort of what was near and dear to our hearts, which was to foster this tinkering and entrepreneurship. But the other we thought was equally important, particularly coming from the city where 9-11 happened, 
was to make sure that we were giving back to the community, that, so that the community didn't think we were just this selfish group of hobbyists that was playing with dangerous things. So what we envisioned was a lab that could educate the general public, could allow people to come in and experience science hands-on. Because really, there's nothing like experience something hands-on and really doing wet work to give yourself, to, de to demystify it. What I say is if you've come into GenSpace and you've done genetic engineering with your 14-year-old daughter, you're not quite so scared of it. So we found this great space in the building that Kevin mentioned. Uh, the lab is made of recycled materials. Um, we could have started out just doing stuff like other groups were doing. This is an example of re-engineered lab equipment, um, the open PCR project, a gel box, and the Dremel Fuge. But what we decided to do was something a little bit more. So this is some footage that was taken by Discovery Channel Canada of our lab. Um, they asked us to buy the donuts. We don't, easily, we don't usually eat that badly. And these are the examples of some sort of the projects that we do. Uh, there's some algae experiments one of our members is doing. These are two kids doing uh, what's called DNA barcoding as a project for their high school. There is a Google employee who comes in on weekends and at night because he wants to make uh, bonsai trees for his friends that smell like peppermint or that are different colors, sort of uh, actualizing uh, Freeman Dyson's um, individual biotech dream. Uh, this is uh, footage of a bioartists project. Uh, we also have a project where we're collecting samples from the stratosphere, microbial samples, and one of our colleagues at Cornell Weill Medical College is going to do deep sequencing on them. That was just, that, that's not the real device, that was just a dry run. So everyone has their own individual little things that they're doing in this space. And th that's an iGEM team. We actually mounted an iGEM team, and this is an example of a bacteria that is expressing something called a quantum dot, which is what our project was. So it's really kind of cool if you say that you have this space. Scientists' light, eyes light up when you tell them, I have this space, you can do a project. All we care about is that it's safe. We don't care if it makes money. We don't care if it's new to the world. It can be just new to you. We don't care if it's likely to work. And we don't care if it's going to save mankind. You're free to tinker. And that is something that I think a lot of scientists got into science in the beginning because of. They love to tinker. So it's kind of a safe space. And what you're seeing now is a nature medicine video of some of the classes that we run. And we have everyone from architects to retirees to finance people who say, I want to want, know what those guy, biotech guys are doing with my money, who, who join these classes and have a great time. We also do a lot of outreach events. This was something uh, we were in Tompkins Square Park at a, um, a bioart festival called Conflux, where you were supposed to look at the city from a different perspective. So people were going into this green market and extracting DNA from the fruits and vegetables. And just something as simple as a DNA extraction, which we do with children and in, in other events, is it just brings out that love of science that we want to kind of reawaken in the American public. And we go on the road. Here's a, a, some stuff from Maker Fair where we were actually doing, um, people were extracting DNA from their cheek cells and we were sending, sending it out for mitochondrial DNA sequencing, which is how they do that ancestry stuff. So what is the future of this? Well, what I'd like to say is this, this is probably not accurate because I don't think people have been really good at plugging in their locations on this map, but this is from the main DIY Google group. And these are all the locations where people say that they're doing this sort of biotech. And what I would like to see, uh, we had a great experience this year. We were invited to Maker Fair Africa. So we were actually at American University in Cairo. We got out right before the latest violence, and it just makes us sick. It's such a great place. But we did uh, some DIY, DIY lab equipment, some DIY genomics. Uh, I love their sense of humor, hack like an Egyptian. And what we would like to see is for everyone had to have the opportunity to come up close and personal with their own DNA. I think it's very important. It's very important for the future of biotech. It's important for the future of the country that this huge resource that could be citizen science is not wasted. 
And right now, I think we're at the stage where the different community labs are building their infrastructure. But once that stage is through, I think we'll be able to avail ourselves of all of the technology that this conference is about, where we can actually get people together and really leverage the power of the citizen science. Um, Esther Dyson mentioned 23andMe. That's an example where people are sharing data and they've actually discovered a lot of new markers because people are willing to share their biomedical or their physical data and it gets matched up with the genomic data that they've um, processed through 23andMe. So if nothing else, there's a huge potential for that sort of crowdsourced science. And on top of that, I think, is this potential that Oliver mentioned, that you never know where the next innovation is going to come from. Uh, and I think that the community labs are really going to be flexing their muscle, and we'll have to see what they do. But uh, I really believe that this is going to be a very, very exciting field that all of you should just keep an eye on. Thanks.